Well, I was preparing for this sermon. There's actually this, this, this chapter, Ezekiel 37, is great. It's, I, I've always loved this story about the bones being brought to life. You just, you know, seeing a valley of bones, and then God brings them all together, and, you know, the, the muscles start building up on them, and the flesh, and the skin covering them, and everything like that. It's an awesome story. And I know years and years and years ago, you know, I was still a babe in Christ. I'd read it, it's just like, what in the world is going on here? You know, it's just kind of a crazy story. But, uh, but it's still cool, nonetheless. Um, and there's so many applications you can make on this. I'm not going to try to get too far off base. We're going to stick mostly with what this passage is talking about. Now, I wanted to get to the whole chapter in one sermon because the two, there's two stories going on here. One is with the bones, and then the other one is this, the latter half of the chapter where he's talking about the two sticks. And he makes the two sticks one, and he prophesies, again, about future events. So I'm going to be covering that part of chapter 37 tonight. So if you're able to make it tonight, I recommend coming back because um, they, these two sermons are really going to be going together. It's practically going to be like a part one and a part two. Even though there's different subjects, the two go well together. These two stories within this chapter fit together perfectly, and I'm going to explain a lot more about that tonight. But this morning, I'll be focusing on the, the dead bones and these dead bones coming to life. Now, obviously, we could, there's a lot of symbolism and representation we, could, we can apply to just the concept of death. Bones, bones that have been sitting there for a long time, right? These dead carcasses just became bones, just out in the desert, strewn about, and, and lifeless, doing nothing. And then God comes along, and I like, he, asks, he asks Ezekiel, verse number 3, uh, look down at verse number 3 here, he says, And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? Now imagine if God asks you, hey, you just see a pile of bones. Can these bones live? You'd be like... Why are you asking me, God? You know, he said, I answered, oh, Lord God, thou know it. Like, like, you know, God. You know, in, in, our, in our human wisdom, we're thinking, like, of course these bones can't live. They're bones, right? They're dead and gone and, and, and done with. It's over. But see, God sees the bones, and he says, hey, can these bones live? And with humility, Ezekiel says, you know, well, you know, God, I don't know. You know. In verse 4, he says, again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. And he goes and uses preaching. He tells Ezekiel, basically, these bones are going to live. And this is the way we're going to do it. You are going to prophesy unto them. You are going to preach to these dead bones. And that's going to bring life back into those dead bones. And you know, again, there's so many applications we can make to this. The first and foremost, probably the easiest one to see, is that before you come to Christ... When you're just dead in your sins, you're literally just a bunch of dead bones walking around because your end is going to be hell. As sinners, you, you have no life in you. Yes, you are physically alive, but spiritually you're dead. And when you breathe your last breath as, a, as an unsaved sinner, you're going to hell where the dead are. And the way that we receive life is when God's word is planted in your heart and takes root, and you put your faith on that, on that word, and that new life is brought forth, of course, and that comes through preaching of God's word. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we hear God's word preached, that's when we receive God's word, and that's when these dead bones now all of a sudden are full of life. And throughout the, um, this passage here in Ezekiel 37, what he's doing is he, he continues to tell them to preach. And the more he continues to preach, we see the bones, you know, first the bones are just gathered together, right? And they, they make a form. And then the, the sinews start to grow, right? The muscles. And then the flesh covers that. And then the skin covers that. And, and, and slowly but surely, the, the, the body really starts to come together into a, into a form, into, into a form of a man that's, that's complete, that's whole. And see, when you get saved, it's almost like you're still just kind of a, a skeleton. Like you've come together, you've got life, but you need, you need to keep growing. You need to keep hearing the preaching, the prophesying, to strengthen you, to build those spiritual muscles up, to cover those muscles then with the flesh. And then to cover that with your skin and, and you're adding and adding upon your growth until you could 
make yourself in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. That's obviously the end goal. When you continue to, to seek out God's word after you're saved and to grow and, and to do what's right and to get sins out of your life and to be more conformed in the image of his son. Now that's, that's all great. And I, I see another application with this too, and I'll just bring this up briefly, but then we're going to get into what the Bible is really specifically talking about because I don't want to overpass that just with other things that we could, we could apply this to. But I see this also as um, the, the movement that's going on right now in many churches that are starting to pop up more and more, it seems, throughout the country is getting a lot of traction as people who have this desire to want to get back to God's word. Get back to what the Bible actually says. Stop compromising with the world. Being willing to just say, thus saith the Lord, and not worry about what the repercussions are, not worry about who's going to be angry with us, and not worry about you know, people leaving the church or anything like that. Just worrying about staying true to God's word. And just saying, I'm going to live my life because God said so. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold standards for myself. I'm going to try to be holy. I'm going to try to do the best that I can because I love God. And I want to serve God, and I'm not going to just, just water everything down and build some kind of a fun center just to pack up the seats and to bring in a lot of money and, and just to say, oh, we're doing some great work for God. Because God is way more concerned about you doing things the right way than just filling a bunch of seats and having a bunch of people do ultimately nothing. And this is, you know, what we're seeing, I believe we're seeing is, the, the dead bones of kind of the, the real Christianity, but just people who have kind of been dying off. Forgetting the first works. Not going out and getting people saved and just have gotten really complacent and churches are dying across. The, and, and this is true. Churches are dying across the nation. And there needs to be new life breathed into them. There needs to be preaching, prophesying, coming from the word of God to get these bones back together again, get these congregations back together again and serving the Lord and growing and becoming stronger and doing great works for the Lord. And we see that happening as well. And I think that these dead bones all across America are, are, are starting to get some life breathed into them by the hard preaching. And people hear that and recognize that. I mean, I know that's the way it was for me. I'm the type of person that just, hey, I just want to know what the truth is. Don't worry about if it offends me or not. Just tell me the truth. I'm a big boy. I can handle it. You know, I don't need you to sugarcoat something for me. If I'm in sin, just point it out to me. I'd rather just have it hurt a little bit and sting a little bit. Oh, man, I'm wrong about that. And get through it and get over it and change my life to actually be right than for no one to say anything about it. You know, a silly example representation of that would be, you know, how would you like to be walking around all day you know, with a, with a kick me sign on your back or something. Like, no one wants you to be embarrassed because you've got this sign on your back, right? That might embarrass you a little bit, but you're going to be, it's going to be way worse to just continue walking around like that for everyone to see. Right? Wouldn't you like someone to say, hey, brother, uh, this is on your back. You're going to take it off. It may be a little embarrassing at first, but that they're helping you, right? I'd rather hear the hard preacher. I'd rather hear what God's word really says and have it, maybe offend me, maybe rub me the wrong way a little bit at first and just be like, oh man, oh, I can't, believe, oh. But then accept it because it's God's word and get right and then say, okay, well, yeah, I've been doing this wrong for however many decades or however many years or months or whatever and know about it so that I can fix it and change it and get it right. And I think there's a lot of people that they just want to hear the truth. Don't tell me your opinion. Don't tell me what's going what's gonna to jive with the world and everyone else and so that everyone's just happy with you. I want to know what's right. I want to know what's true. And this is, this is what people have been, have been starving for. And now is finally getting life breathed into to people all over the place that have this desire to, to hear the truth and people who are not afraid to just stand up and say, yeah, I'm going to preach God's word. Whether it offends you or not, I'm going to preach God's word because I'm just a messenger. And it's not about me anyways. But let's get a little bit more into, in this, in this passage, 
what the Bible says this is really representing. Because that's where I want to spend the most of my time this morning is focusing on that. You know, th these are great illustrations and great examples. It's a great story. And I don't think these applications are wrong. I think we can see that. I think there's, there's truth in there. But I want to focus really on what this literally is talking about this morning. Let's keep reading here. We're in Ezekiel 37. Verse number five says, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Again, going back to my previous point, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that aren't prophesying as they're commanded because God commands to, to cry aloud, to spare not, to raise up your voice like a trumpet and show the house of Israel their sins. We're commanded to preach the whole counsel of God, everything, everything. It's the good, it's the hope, it's the long suffering, it's the joy, it's the peace, it's the, you know, the faith, and it's also the law, sin, transgression, judgment, everything. The whole counsel of God, it's all important. It all needs to be taught and preached. And that's what God's commanding. And Ezekiel was a faithful witness. He was a faithful preacher to prophesy as he was commanded. And you'll see that is a common trait among all the men of God that God uses. God said this, and I repeated it. That's what they do. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. Look at the, the powerful things that can happen when you just submit to the authority of God and do what he tells you to do. Do you think these bones were coming together on the authority and power of Ezekiel? Not a chance. Of course not. He's probably thinking there's no way these bones are. But hey, with God, I'm just going to do what God tells me to do. I'm going to have faith in God's word. It may seem silly to go prophesy to a bunch of dead bones, but it wasn't very silly very long when these bones started coming together. The world might look at you like you're crazy. I mean, the world looks at us like we're crazy. What are you doing going out and talking to strangers and talking about Jesus? It's foolishness to the world. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to the world. But to us, it's the power of God. Verse 8, And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet an exceeding great army. From dead, dry, old bones to an exceeding great army, an army for the Lord. I don't think this, you know, this is obviously very symbolic, and I don't think it's very different than what God wants us to do today. He wants us to go out and preach his word as he commands to the dead, dry bones that are out there. The people that you think, oh, they don't want to have anything to do with God. Well, maybe they will. Maybe you should just not worry about your own wisdom and think about, well, these bones are never going to come to life. I'm not going to worry about preaching the gospel to that person because there's no way they're going to receive it. Why don't you just do as he commanded and preach the gospel to every creature and go out and just rely on his word to do the power, his word to, to, to have the power and do the work. And you just do what you're told. And you, you shouldn't be surprised then when you end up seeing a great army for the Lord as a result of being obedient and preaching and prophesying His word. Don't stand in your own wisdom, oh, those are just dead bones. Look at verse number 11. Then He said unto me, Son of man, now, this is where we get the interpretation. This is where we get the true understanding of what he's really saying here. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So the whole reason he went through this exercise is to point out, this is the condition, this is the state that the house of Israel is in today. They're a bunch of dead bones, and they need the preaching and prophesying of God's word. He says, behold, they say, so this is what the house of Israel is saying. Our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. 
They have got, they've reached a point of hopelessness. They've lost their faith. They've reached a point where they're just a bunch of dead bones. Verse 12, so as a result of this, he says, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Now God makes a great promise here, saying, I'm going to open up your graves. You're going to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. When they say that their hope is lost, God follows up with a great promise. And you know what this promise is? It's the resurrection. It's a promise of the resurrection, of the dead coming back to life, the dead being raised in incorruptible, the dead being brought back and brought into a land. And this is where I don't want to get too far into that subject because that's why he continues on with the second parable with the sticks becoming one nation and one land and again refers to like the millennial reign of Christ. I'm going to get into that a lot more tonight. But he starts off here in this. He's saying, no, you do have hope. You do have a reason to hope. There is a resurrection of the dead. You are not, this is not all there is. There's, you do not have to have a, a lost hope. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. This is our memory verse, our memory passage. We're not to these verses yet, but Ephesians chapter 2 in the New Testament. Ephesians 2. When he says there, it's the whole house of Israel is saying our hope is lost. There's another group of people that have no hope. Verse number 11, Ephesians 2, the Bible says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Without God, without faith in Jesus Christ, there is no hope. There's a lot of people who, who are, you know, they call themselves atheists. They don't want to believe that there is God. What kind of a miserable, I mean, that is a miserable outlook on life. That's horrible. It is horrible. It's, 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 it is tragic and people like that, I mean, you have no hope because all you have is this lifetime. And if this, in this life is all we have, we are among all men most miserable is what the Bible says, especially for those that are living for Christ. Say, if Christ didn't come and die, you know, we're of all men most miserable. But what type of hopelessness is that to not have a redeemer, to not have a savior, to know that death is imminent? In all of our lives, you see it. It's natural. You don't have to believe in any God to see that death happens to every man. That no one escapes death. It's that, that, is, that is the end. But it doesn't have to be the end. That's the end of your flesh. But it's not the end of your existence. And the end that we look for provides us hope. It provides us to be in a place where we don't have to feel like we're just walking around a bunch of dead bones. God reveals a reason to hope. There's hope in the resurrection. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament. Luke chapter 24. There is a bit of hopelessness even among the apostles and the disciples of Jesus Christ right after Jesus died on the cross. You think about that, and we're going to look at a passage here where Jesus comes up on a couple of disciples. They're walking around, and they're talking about the events that had just happened. And, you know, they, what they were expecting, see, what part of the problem is what they were expecting Jesus to do was a little bit different than what Jesus actually did. They didn't quite understand the prophecies of Jesus Christ, they were getting confused between his first coming and his second coming and kind of merged them together because they were kind of expecting Jesus Christ to come and set up his kingdom on this earth and rule and reign for a thousand years when he came. 
and they were they were wrong about that but that's that's why when he was like getting arrested and everything else they're kind of thinking like well what's going on and their eyes they, they, they weren't opened up to the scriptures yet though the new testament opens up and reveals all of those prophecies from the old testament to help us understand them better they didn't have the luxury of, of having the new testament to read and see everything that happened they were going through it and they had different expectations and a slightly different understanding of of the old testament prophecies so of course when jesus is arrested and he's nailed to the cross and he, he they he's dead and they buried his body and they're thinking now what now what we were expecting him to come and save Israel and, and, and set up his kingdom and reign. Now what? The hope is lost. Look at verse number 17 of Luke 24. Luke 24, verse 17, the Bible says, And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? See, they're depressed. They're sad. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast, thou, hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Look at this in verse 21. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. They were thinking, well, hey, we fully trusted that he's the Redeemer of Israel. But their concept of the Redeemer of Israel for what he came to do was a little bit off. And then, of course, he explains to them, you know, and, and they go on and say, you know, there's other people that came to his grave and they found it empty and we don't know what's going on. And then Jesus explains to him, look, all of this stuff had to happen and just schools them on all the prophecies that they were screwed up on and just is like, look, and it says that he explained everything that, that all the scriptures concerning himself, that he had to come, he had to die, and he is the savior of the world. He is the savior of Israel. He's the savior in that he's saving their souls. He's delivered their souls from hell. And he will come again and set up a kingdom here, but that's not coming for a long time. So for a, little, for a very short period of time, even people who were disciples were without hope. They were, they were, they were confused. They were sad. They were depressed. But we have the luxury now of knowing that Jesus Christ did rise again from the dead. This is where our faith lies. We don't have to be hopeless because Jesus Christ conquered death. I mean, if there's one thing that's kind of scary in this world, a lot of people get, get afraid, or is afraid about, it would be death, dying. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. That's what most people have is fear or concern. I don't know what's going to happen when I die. We don't have to have fear of death because death is not the end for us. Jesus Christ already came and died and was buried and was dead for three days and three nights. But of course, God raised him up again from the dead. And that's signifying our own resurrection. Because if we are dead with Christ, we shall also live with him. Turn, if you would, to um, Matthew chapter 27. I just want to point this out real briefly because in Ezekiel 37, what we also saw, and I'll read this for you, what we also saw in Ezekiel 37 was a prophecy that was at least partially fulfilled with Jesus Christ's resurrection. You're turning to Matthew 27. I'm going to read a couple verses from Ezekiel 37. Uh, Ezekiel 37, 13 says, And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Everything with God's word, when it comes to pass, he's saying, you know it's from me. You know that I've spoken it and said it because when I say it, it always comes to pass. And he's saying here, he's explaining you're going to know, he's trying to give them hope, and he's saying there's going to be a resurrection. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead, and he's talking about two different things. One is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and one is the resurrection that we're all going to face when Jesus Christ comes back. There is a second resurrection. And, um, and we're going to get into that, too, a little bit near the end of the sermon. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15. But um, in Matthew 27, look at verse number 50. The Bible reads, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. 
And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. All this happened when Jesus Christ was, was crucified on the cross. And then it says, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. One way that we could know the prophecy in Ezekiel 37 came true is because right after Jesus rose again from the dead, some of the, some of the saints, some of the believers in God actually came up out of their graves. Now, there's not a whole lot that's, that's spoken about this in Scripture. It's, a, it's just a few verses, but it's using the same exact terminology. It says, and the graves were opened. Just like it said in Ezekiel 37, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. We know that this is of God when, I mean, and that should, I mean, this is such a great miracle. I, you, you died last week. You died a month ago. And they're coming up out of the grave and, and preaching Jesus Christ. That's amazing. And, uh, Again, going to show nothing is impossible with God. Even being raised again from the dead. Something that science can not do and will never be able to do is to bring somebody back to life who is dead. When your soul is departed from your body and you're, you know, you, when, when, when death occurs, you know, you can't, you know, there's different definitions for death. But when you use the Bible definition for dead, science isn't bringing you back from the dead. I'm sorry, that's just not going to happen. Your heart may stop beating and you're, you know, clinically you may be considered dead. Your brain may even stop functioning for a little while and come back. But, but biblical death, there's no coming back from. But God does and can bring back from the dead. Turn if you to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. See, the, the, the reason why Israel, the house of Israel, was sad was because they had no hope. And God offered them the hope of a resurrection. And the resurrection is critical to our salvation. It's what we rely on. It's where our hope rests is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So make sure, just as a side note, when you go out and preach the gospel of Jesus, I know we focus a lot on, on maybe showing people, hey, you're a sinner, you deserve this punishment. And we focus also a lot on eternal security and just saying, hey, you know, once you're saved, you're saved forever. It's eternal life. You can never lose that. We need to make sure we're doing a good job of explaining the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that is where the power, I mean, the, the death, the burial, the resurrection, that is all, that is the gospel. And that is where our hope is lying, is that, hey, we are going to die one day, but you know what? We're going to live again. Jesus was proof of that. Jesus was raised again from the dead, and we have our hope in that too. So when our bodies die, that's not it. We're going to be raised again from the dead, and we are trusting completely and relying on that. Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 19. Romans 8.19, the Bible reads, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, I was expounding this a little bit for you in case you get a little confused over the wording. Creature, we're, we're a created being. It's our flesh. It's, you know, it's, it's who we are physically as a person. We are a creature of God. The earnest expectation, what we are looking for earnestly, the expectation of the creature, we're waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. When you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again spiritually, you become a son of God. But the full manifestation of being a son of God is when this vile body is changed, when we get a new glorified body and we truly become a full son of God in the sense that we are completely delivered. Because right now we're only partially delivered. We're, we're saved for sure. There's no doubt about that. Our soul is saved. Our spirit is, is new life. 
And, this, and, and that is never going to go away, but it's still our, our entire salvation is still only partial in regards to we still have this sinful, wicked body. So it's not going to be until we get our new body where our spirit, soul, and body are all going to be saved, as it were, and completely redeemed. So that's what this is referring to. Say, Our earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who was subjected to the same in hope. Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Our person, who we are, we're going to be delivered from this bondage of corruption, which is in our flesh, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. See, because sin, sin brought death into the world and God's perfect creation was corrupted. But there is going to be a new heaven, a new earth, just like we're going to have a new body. God's going to make all things new again. And we're going to realize the way things were intended to be. But until that point, the whole creation groans. I mean, there's, there's, there's death and despair and decay all throughout the world because sin was brought into the world. Verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body, which is what I was just talking about. Verse 24, For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why did he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Hope is critical. It's important. That's what we're relying on. It's this hope of the resurrection. It's faith. Faith and hope are very similar. It's probably the same exact thing. We're hoping for something. We're putting our faith in something. It's something that's not seen. Faith is the, the, substance of, is the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for. If you can see it, there's no reason to hope for it. It's right there in front of your face. If you could see something, you don't have to have faith in it. It's right there. We're saved by that hope. Uh, I'll just read this for you. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. This hope of the resurrection is critical to salvation as I mentioned earlier. And this is one of the reasons why the Jehovah's Witnesses are not saved. Why well, they're not true believers because they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ came back in his own body. They believe he appeared in a body. It's a, it's a really bizarre belief that they have. But in 1 Peter 3, it says that we, we are begotten again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ coming back and showing Thomas the holes in his hands and proving he came back to life I mean, our faith is, is reliant on that. We're dependent on the fact that he came back to life and, and, and truly rose again from the dead because that pictures our resurrection that we're going to come back to life also. And, um, you know, you've got the Jehovah's False Witnesses going out there and they don't, they don't like to talk about this because just like all the cults do, the Mormons do the same thing. They want to make it sound like they have some extra knowledge, but they're still real similar to you. And they don't want to sound like it's really weird what they believe in. So a lot of these things they won't, they won't bring up. But, um, but, it, but it's important. It, it, it's critical. You know, and not believing, uh, not believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is literally what they're doing. It, they'll, they'll say they believe it and come up with some other way to, to, to explain it away. But they don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't believe he bodily came back. 1 Corinthians 15 Excellent passage to turn to when you're soul winning, when you're trying to preach the gospel to people, the gospel being the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15. I mean, this whole chapter is, like, is a resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel 
which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So he's saying here, I'm, I'm declaring unto you the gospel, which I've already preached unto you, and this is the gospel by which you're saved. Verse number three, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. I know this is real simple, basic stuff, but we need to go over this um, because it's so critical, important to our faith. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Just showing and proving he really did come back to life. He was seen of many people. He was seen of over 500 people at one time. 500 witnesses in one moment was able to see him. He's saying that his resurrection, he came back. It is true. It is sure. Jump down to verse number 12. The Bible reads, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, some people back then were, were, did not believe in a resurrection. They weren't saved. They were known commonly as the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection of the dead. But the Apostle Paul's preaching here. He's saying, well, how, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If, if, if it's not possible for there to be a resurrection, then Jesus Christ didn't come back from the dead because there's no resurrection. But now you got a problem with the over 500 witnesses and Cephas and everyone else that people were looking to and were performing these miracles and everything else, preaching the word of God that said Jesus Christ did come back to, to life. Let's keep reading. He says, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. Then what we're saying means nothing. If Jesus Christ didn't come back from the dead, if there was no resurrection, then everything we're doing is meaningless. That's how important Jesus Christ's resurrection is to our salvation. And your faith is also vain Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. He's saying if he didn't come back to life, then we're just bearing false witness because we all say that he did come back to life. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. He's saying if Christ didn't come back to life, if he wasn't re resurrected from the dead, you still have your sins because Christ didn't pay for them then. You, didn't, you don't have a Savior. You're still in your sins if you don't have a Savior that's resurrected from the dead. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. It's important to maintain this hope. Everybody goes through hard times in their life, low points, trials, tribulations, where you might feel like you don't have a lot of hope. You might start to question, is, what, is life even worth living? You might question a lot of things, especially when people have a lot of tragedies that happen in their life, or even just one, I mean, not a lot of tragedies, one tragedy is enough to make you really question things and can get you down and get you low and make you feel like you have no hope. But there is hope. And, and the best hope that we have, especially with, with tragedies where people die, is if you know that that person had their faith in Jesus Christ, even that tragedy is, is, is made a lot, um, the, the impact could be, could be softened and lessened because Jesus Christ came back from the dead, and we know that. And our faith lies in that. And we know that there is a resurrection of the dead and that the physical death, that's temporary because there is a resurrection and we have hope in that and that can help us to keep moving forward and to keep going forward, to, to maintain that hope. Say, no, Christ went through the worst of the worst because Jesus Christ died and was buried and his soul went to hell for three days and three nights. 
And he said, even in, uh, in, in Acts chapter 2, I don't have this in my notes, but... Um, Yeah, in verse 26 of Acts 2, he says, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also, my flesh shall rest in hope. Jesus Christ, speaking of his body that was buried, he says, My flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Even Jesus Christ, when he died and his soul went to hell, had a hope. Because he, was gonna, he knew he was going to be risen again from the dead. He knew that he would come back. So he had that hope. And um, obviously, we don't have to worry about going to hell if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. But he went to hell to pay for our sins. And our hope rests in him. And him being raised again from the dead, we have hope through that. Now, um, let's keep going through this chapter. There's so much in this chapter. I, I'm running out of time here. Um, Verse number 20 of 1 Corinthians 15, where we were, 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 20. Because verse 19 says, If in this life we have hope, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Meaning that if Christ didn't come back from the dead and, and this is all we got is right here, well, we're miserable because why? Because if you're living a godly life, if you're going and preaching the word of God and stuff, and you know, you're going to face a lot more persecutions, your life isn't going to be very comfortable. And if this is all we got, man, we're, all, we're, we're more miserable than everyone else. I mean, we might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die if there's no hope, if there's no resurrection. Verse 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man death came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. This is talking about being made alive, the resurrection. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After, afterward, they that are Christ said is coming, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So there are three resurrections that the Bible explains to us here. First was Christ, which he's just the first fruits because it's not some massive resurrection. It was Jesus Christ came back from the dead in his glorified body to die no more. Those that came up out of their graves after the resurrection, those people did end up dying again. So that was a resurrection, but not the, not, not the resurrection that we're speaking of here. Because when Jesus Christ at his coming, it says afterward they that are Christ at his coming, that is when in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. Our bodies will be changed. If we, if we are alive and remain unto the coming of Christ, then we will lose this body. Or actually, we're not going to lose this body. This body is going to be changed. Our fleshly body right now is going to be converted to a spiritual body, to a body that is, that is uncorruptible. And that will be our resurrection. So those of us who are alive, that's going to happen. And those that have passed on already, that are, that whose bodies are in the grave, they're going to come up and those bodies are going to be changed also. And they're going to meet the spirit and soul of the people who had possessed those bodies in the past with a new body. That is the resurrection being referred to here. And then it says, then come at the end, after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, when he delivers the kingdom back up unto God the Father and, and everything's being wrapped up before the new heaven and the new earth, that's the final resurrection because that's it. And that will be the last resurrection. So let's jump down here, verse number 29. The Bible says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Again, he goes back and forth in this chapter. I know we skipped some verses of people who are not believing in the resurrection. And that's kind of the purpose of chapter 15 is just really expounding on this truth and, and driving it home that, that Christ is risen and that you know if, if he's not risen, then we're all in trouble because then we're still in our sins. And he says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? He's saying, you know, we baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We baptize people just like Jesus was baptized, just like John the Baptist baptized people. Why are we baptizing people for a man, for Jesus Christ, if he didn't even raise again from the dead? 
That's what he's saying. He said, why do we baptize them for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Jump down to verse number 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Look at his response. He's saying he's to just some criticism, some question. Well, how are the dead raised up, and what body do they come with? He says, thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quick and accept it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So he's explaining, you know, when a seed gets planted, it looks way different than what actually comes back up from the dirt. Right? You plant some little seed, some kernel, whatever it is that you're trying to plant, and the actual plant that comes up looks nothing like that at all. It's completely different. The same way when our bodies, our, our physical bodies are planted in the ground when we die, the resurrection, it's going to be a completely different body. It's not going to be this flesh and blood body that we have now. Look at uh, verse number 39. He says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And he just explained it real briefly, like, not all flesh is the same. Obviously, your, your flesh isn't the same as an animal, as a bird, whatever. A fish, a fish has obviously a different flesh than, than, a, than a bird. You know, they're, they're different types of flesh. But then he goes on to explain even further, verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, which means celestial would be like heavenly bodies. Terrestrial would be of the earth, like an earthly body. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. Our bodies are corrupt. Our flesh is corrupt. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. That's the man that we have today. The second man, well, the first man here is in, of, of the earth, earthy. That's Adam. Adam was made of the earth. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So right now we're bearing the image of the earthy, of Adam that was created. We, we bear his image. And then in our new bodies, we're going to bear the image of Jesus Christ, the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So this is kind of a conclusion, concluding statement here where he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Why? Because the life that we live as a Christian, the way that God wants you to live is not going to be an easy life. There's going to be problems. You're going to face persecutions. As I keep mentioning, these things are going to happen, but we don't need to worry about that because our physical death isn't the end. 
There is this resurrection. He says, therefore, because we know that we have victory over death through Jesus Christ, therefore, let's stay steadfast. Let's be unmovable, unwavering in our faith. Stay true to God's word, always abounding in the work of the Lord, doing more and more and more, having that hope, having that faith, knowing that our work is not in vain. Jesus Christ did rise again from the dead. We have a solid foundation to have our hope based in and let's not just just fall back and have this dead bones mentality of all the hope is lost what's it all good for no we need to remain unmovable we know that Jesus Christ rose again we know that we have victory over death and we know that our work will not go unrewarded that's why it says, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, it's not for nothing. This is the good news. As I mentioned before, we live in a world where death is imminent. It's easy to get depressed. It's easy to get discouraged in this life if this life is all we really have. Death can be a very scary concept, but not for us. I'm going to close with this. One, one of the... Um, you know, this concept of the resurrection, we already saw Ezekiel 37 prophesies of this. This is not an old, just a New Testament teaching. I mean, this has been around all throughout Scripture. There's one place that I love in Job chapter 19 that's very clear about this concept of us receiving a new body and being resurrected. It was stated by Job in Job 19. Job 19.25, the Bible reads, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know he's alive. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job is saying, I know that my Redeemer is going to stand upon the earth. He's going to be here. And that even though worms destroy my physical body, because he's like, I, this is not for a long time to come. My body is going to be buried in the ground and the worms are going to eat my body. Even though I know that's going to happen, he's saying, I know that my Redeemer lives and I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another though my reins be consumed within me. That's the hope that Job had. He relied on that. He knew, even with the, you know, with the little knowledge that Job had, he didn't have the whole New Testament. He didn't have the benefits that we have and so much more reason for hope that we have. He had a lot less information, yet he was firm and confident and steadfast in his hope that he says, in my flesh, when, when my Redeemer is on this earth, I'm going to see him with my flesh. I'm going to be there on that day. You want to know how Job made it through all the trials and tribulations that he faced? You want to know how Job made it through a hopeless situation of his entire family being killed and his wife turning his, her back on him and losing all of his wealth and his health, everything that he had. You want to know how he maintained that? Because he had hope. He had hope in the Lord. He had hope in the resurrection. That got Job through places that I don't think anyone here has ever faced. And I know that there has been some serious tragedies faced by people in this room. Job had 10 children and lost all of them. Job had a lot of wealth and lost everything. Job even lost his own health. He had boils and sores. I mean, talk about a miserable condition to be in. And he never charged God foolishly. And he had hope. And he even, even all the way there in, in Job chapter 19, which is well after he's been, he's been, and his friends come. His friends come to comfort him. And they end up all turning on him saying, you must be in a lot of sin, Job. Yeah, some comforters you are. His wife, why don't you just curse God and die? 
Nobody strengthening him, not one person. His hope and his strength was in the resurrection. He knew that this life, you know, naked came out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return. It's not about this life. His confidence was in the life to come. Be careful when you have the dead bones mentality. We don't want to be stuck there. That'll, that'll destroy any, any good works you're going to be doing for God. We want, we want to maintain the right focus and, and maintain that hope. And when things go bad, remember, hey, this, this world's not my home. We're just passing through. Okay, there is a resurrection. There is a new heaven and a new earth. There is going to be a millennial reign of Christ. And we will see our Savior in the flesh. And that is going to be a glorious day. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great encouragement that we can receive from your words. Lord, what amazing miracles that you do and, and the, the meaning behind them is immeasurable, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to overcome our own constraints that we want to put on things, uh, even in this physical world, dear Lord, and just to have the faith to know that you could make even dead bones come back to life. Help us to be stirred up and motivated to go out and, and preach the gospel to the dead bones that are walking around in our neighborhood today and help us to, to preach unto them your words that bring life and that you can breathe life into them, dear Lord, and that, uh, that you'd use us as your servants to, to lead us and direct us to those people who are going to be willing to listen and be receptive, God. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would please just help us through our difficult times and, uh, and to be able to maintain our hope in, in that resurrection. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.